Conradin was 10 years old and the doctor had pronounced his professional opinion that he would not live for another five. Now the doctor was silky in a feet and counted for little, but his opinion was endorsed by Mrs. De Rop, and Mrs. De Rop counted for nearly everything. Mrs. De Rop was Conradin's cousin and guardian, and in his eyes she represented those three-fifths of the world that are necessary and disagreeable and real. The other two-fifths, in perpetual antagonism with the foregoing, were summed up in himself and his imagination. I mean, one of these days, Conradin supposed, he would succumb to the mastering pressure of necessary things, illnesses and coddling restrictions and drawn-out dullness. But without his imagination, which was rampant under the spur of loneliness, he would have succumbed long ago. Now, Mrs. de Rob would never, even in her most honest moments, have confessed that she disliked Conradin, although she might have been dimly aware that thwarting him for his own good was a duty which he did not find particularly irksome. Conradin, however, hated her with a desperate sincerity. Such few pleasures as he could contrive for himself gained an added relish from the likelihood that they would be displeasing to Mrs. de Rop, and from the realm of his imagination she was quite locked out an unclean thing which could find no entrance. In the dull, cheerless garden of the house that they shared, overlooked by so many windows that were ready to open with a message not to do that, or a reminder that medicines were due, Conradin found little to attract him. I mean, the few fruit trees that it contained were set jealously apart from his plucking, as though they were rare specimens, though in fact it would probably have been difficult to find a market gardener willing to pay ten shillings for their entire yearly produce. In a forgotten corner, however, almost hidden by a dismal shrubbery, there was a disused tool shed. And within the walls of this, Conradin found a haven, something that took on the varying aspects of a playroom and a cathedral. He'd peopled it with a legion of familiar phantoms, evoked partly from fragments of history and partly from his own brain, but it also boasted two inmates of flesh and blood. In one corner lived a ragged plumaged hooden hen, on which Conradin lavished an affection that scarcely had another outlet. Further back, in the gloom stood a large hutch divided into two compartments, one of which was fronted with close iron bars, and in this there lived a large polecat ferret, which a friendly butcher boy had once smuggled in, cage and all, in exchange for a long secreted hoard of small silver. Now Conradin was dreadfully afraid of the lithe, sharp-fanged beast, but it was his most treasured possession. You know, its very presence in the tool shed was a secret and fearful joy. And one day, out of heaven knows what material, he spun the beast a wonderful name. And from that moment, it grew into a god and a religion. Every Thursday, in the dim and musty silence of the tool shed, with mystic and elaborate ceremonial, Conradin worshipped before the wooden hutch where dwelt Sredni Vashtar, the great ferret. Red flowers in their season and scarlet berries in wintertime were offered at his shrine, for he was a god who laid some special stress upon the, the fierce impatient side of things, and on feast days powdered nutmeg was strewn in front of his hutch, an important feature of the offering being that the nutmeg had to be stolen. Now that these festivals were of irregular occurrence and were chiefly appointed to celebrate some passing event. On one occasion, when Mrs. de Rop suffered from acute toothache for three days, Conradin kept up the festival the whole time and almost succeeded in persuading himself that Sredni Vashtar was personally responsible for her suffering. If the malady had lasted for another day, the supply of nutmeg would have given out. Now the Houdan hen was never drawn into the, the cult of Sredni Vashtar. Conradin had long ago settled that she was an Anabaptist. I mean, he did not pretend to have the faintest idea of what an Anabaptist was, but he, he privately hoped that it was dashing and not very respectable. After a while, Conradin's absorption in the tool shed 
began to attract the notice of Mrs. de Rob. It's not good for him to be pottering around there in all weathers, she decided one day. And at breakfast the next morning, she announced that the Hooden hen had been sold and taken away overnight. With her short-sighted eye, she peered at Conradin, waiting for an outbreak of rage and sorrow. But Conradin said nothing. That was nothing to be said. Something perhaps in his white set face gave her a momentary qualm, for at tea that afternoon there was toast on the table, a delicacy which he usually banned on the ground that it was bad for him. I thought you liked toast, she exclaimed with an injured air, observing that he didn't touch it. Sometimes, said Conradin, sometimes I like toast. In the shed that evening, there was an innovation in his worship. Heretofore, Conradin had been wont to simply chant praises of the hutch god, but tonight he asked a boon. Do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar, he whispered. Now, the thing was not specified, as Sredni Vashtar was a god, he must be supposed to know what it was, and choking back a sob as he looked at the other empty corner, Conradin went back to the world that he so hated. But every night hereafter, in the welcome darkness of his bedroom, and every evening in the dusk of the tool shed, Conradin's bitter, deeply felt petition went up. Do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar. Do one thing for me. Mrs. de Rob, of course, noticed that the visits to the shed did not cease, and one day she made a further journey of inspection. What are you keeping in that locked hutch? She asked. I believe it's guinea pigs. I'll have them cleared away. Conradin shut his lips tight. But the woman ransacked his bedroom till she found the carefully hidden key, and forthwith she marched down to the shed to complete her discovery. It was a cold afternoon, and Conradin was confined to the house. From the farthest window of the dining room, the door of the shed could just be seen beyond the corner of the shrubbery where Conradin stationed himself. He saw the woman enter. He imagined her opening the door of the hutch, peering down with her short-sighted eyes into the thick straw where his god lay hidden. Perhaps she'd prodded it with her clumsy impatience. And Conradin fervently breathed his prayer for the last time. But he knew as he prayed that he did not believe. He knew that the woman would come out presently with that pursed smile he loathed so well on her face. And that in an hour or two the gardener would carry away his wonderful god, a god no longer, but simply a brown ferret in a hutch. And he knew that the woman would triumph now as she always triumphed, and that he would grow ever more sickly under her pestering and domineering and superior wisdom, till one day nothing much more would matter with him, and the doctor would have proved right. And in the sting and misery of his defeat, Conradin began to chant out loud the hymn of his threatened idol. Sredni Vashtar went forth, his thoughts were red thoughts and his teeth were white. His enemies called for peace, but he bought them death. Sredni Vashtar the beautiful. And then of a sudden he stopped his chanting and he drew closer to the window pane. The door of the shed still stood ajar as it had been left, and the minutes were slipping by. They were long minutes, but they slipped by nonetheless. Conradin watched the starlings running and flying in little parties across the lawn. He counted them over and over, with one eye always on that swinging door. More minutes. A sour-faced maid came in to lay the table for tea, and still Conradin stood and waited and watched, and now hope crept by inches into his heart, and a look of triumph began to blaze in his eyes that had only ever known the wistful patience of defeat. Under his breath, with a furtive exultation, he began once again the pian of victory and devastation, and presently his eyes were rewarded. Out 
through the doorway came a long, low, yellow and brown beast, eyes a blink at the waning daylight, with dark wet stains around the fur of jaws and throat. Conradin dropped to his knees. The great polecat ferret made its way down to a small brook at the foot of the garden, drank for a moment, then crossed a little plank bridge and was lost to sight in the bushes. Such was the passing of Sredni Vashtar. Tea's ready, said the sour-faced maid. Where's mistress? Oh, she went down to the shed some time ago, said Conradin. And while the maid went to summon her mistress for tea, he fished a toasting fork out of the sideboard drawer and proceeded to toast himself a piece of bread. And during the toasting of it, and the buttering of it with much butter, and the slow enjoyment of eating it, Conrad had listened to the noises and silences which fell in quick spasms beyond the dining room door, the loud foolish screaming of the maid, the answering chorus of wondering ejaculations from the kitchen region, the scuttering footsteps and hurried embassies for outside help, and then after a lull, the scared sobbings and the shuffling tread of those who bore a heavy burden into the house. Whoever will break it to the poor child? I couldn't for the life of me, exclaimed a shrill voice. And while they debated the matter among themselves, Conradin made himself another piece of toast. It was a chill, rain-washed afternoon of a late August day, that indefinite season when partridges still roam in security and there's nothing left to hunt. Unless, of course, one is bounded on the north by the Bristol Channel, in which case one may lawfully gallop after fat red stags. Now, the, the country estate of Lady Victoria Blemley was not bounded in any direction by the Bristol Channel, however, so there was a full gathering of guests around a tea table on this particular occasion. And in spite of the, the blankness of the season and the triteness of the occasion, there was no trace in the company of that fatigued restlessness, which means a dread of the pianola and a subdued hankering for auction bridge. For the undisguised open-mouthed attention of the entire party was fixed on the homely negative personality of Mr Cornelius Appin. Now of all her guests Appin was the one who'd come to Lady Blemley with the vaguest reputation. Someone had told her that he was clever and he'd got his invitation in the moderate expectation that some portion of that cleverness would be contributed to the weekend's general entertainment. Until tea time that day, however, she'd been unable to discover in what direction, if any, Appin's cleverness lay. I mean, he was neither a wit nor a croquet champion. He was not a mesmerist or a begetter of amateur theatricals. He, he was indifferent at bezique, nor does his exterior suggest the sort of man in whom women are willing to pardon a generous measure of mental deficiency. He'd substituted into plain Mr. Appin, and the Cornelius had begun to seem like a transparent piece of baptismal bluff. But now, now, he was claiming to have launched on the world a discovery beside which the invention of gunpowder or the printing press or steam locomotion were inconsiderable trifles. Now, it's true that science has made bewildering strides in many directions during recent decades, but this thing seems to belong more to the realm of miracle than scientific achievement. Well, and, and, and you really ask us to believe, Sir Wilfrid was saying, that you've discovered a means of instructing animals in the art of human speech, and, and, and that our, our dear old cat, Tobermory, has, has proved your first successful pupil. Uh, well, said Mr Appin, yes, I, it, it's a problem at which I, I've laboured for the last 17 years, but only during the, the last eight or nine months have I been rewarded with any glimmerings of success. 
I mean, of course, I, I've experimented with, with thousands of different animals, but naturally only with cats. They're, they're, they're the most wonderful creatures. You, you see, they, they've assimilated themselves so marvellously with our civilization, and yet they've retained their own highly developed feral instincts. I mean, here and there, you see, among cats, one comes across an outstanding superior intellect just as one does among the ruck of human beings and when i made the acquaintance of tobermory a week ago well you know i saw at once that i was in contact with what i call a beyond cat you know a feline of singular ability and intelligence yeah I, I've, I've gone quite far you see along the road to success in recent experiments but with tobermory as you call him i have achieved my goal Mr. Appin concluded his remarkable statement in a voice which he strove to divest of a triumphant inflection. I mean, no one actually said rats, although Clovis Sangrail's lips moved in a monosyllabic contortion which probably invoked those rodents of disbelief. And, and, and do you mean to say, asked Miss Resker, that, that you've taught Tobermory to say and understand easy sentences of one syllable? Oh, oh, oh no! No, no, my, my dear Miss Resco, no, no, no. I mean, yeah, well, what one teaches children in, in that piecemeal fashion, backwards adults perhaps, savages, but no, I mean, when one has once solved the problem of making a beginning with an animal of highly developed intelligence, one has no need of these halting methods. No, I, I assure you that Tobermory can speak our language with perfect correctness and fluency. This time Clovis very distinctly said, beyond rats. Sir Wilfred was more polite, but equally sceptical. Well, I, I think we'd better have the cat in and judge for ourselves, hadn't we? He, he said, and he, he set off in search of Tobermory, while the company settled themselves down to the languid expectation of witnessing some more or less adroit piece of drawing-room ventriloquism. In a minute, however, their host was back in the room, his face white beneath its tan, and his eyes dilated with excitement. Begad, it's true, he exclaimed. Now his agitation was unmistakably genuine, and his hearers started forward in a thrill of wakened interest. Collapsing into an armchair, Sir Wilfred continued breathlessly. I, I, I found him dozing in the smoking room, Tobermory, I mean, and I, I called out to him to come for his tea. He blinked at me in his usual way, and I said, Come on, Toby, don't keep us waiting. And damn me if he didn't draw out in a most horribly natural voice that he'd come when he dashed well pleased. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Now, Appin had preached to largely incredulous hearers, but Sir Wilfred's statement carried instant conviction, and a chorus of startled exclamation arose, amid which the scientist sat, mutely enjoying the first fruit of his stupendous discovery. In the midst of this clamour, Tobermory himself entered, and made his way with velveteen tread and studied unconcern across the room. Oh, a sudden hush of awkwardness and constraint fell on the company. There, there seemed to be somehow an element of embarrassment in addressing on equal terms a domestic cat. But, but after a moment, Lady Blemley spoke in a rather strained voice. Will you have some milk, Tobermory? Yeah, all right, thanks, came the response couched in a tone of even indifference. Well, a shiver of suppressed excitement ran through the listeners, and Lady Blemley might be excused for pouring out the source of all of milk rather unsteadily. Oh, I, I, I'm afraid I, I've spilt a good deal of it, she said apologetically. Yeah, well, it's not my axe, Minster, is it? replied the cat. Another silence fell on the group. And then Miss Resker, in her best district visitor manner, asked if the human language had been difficult to learn. Tobermory looked squarely at her for a moment and then fixed his gaze serenely on the middle distance. It was obvious that boring questions lay outside his scheme of life. What, what do you think of human intelligence? asked Mavis Pellington after another pause. Or of whose intelligence in particular? asked Tobermory coldly. Oh, oh. Well, hmm, mine, for instance. Hmm. 
Well, Mavis, you, you put me in a rather embarrassed position there, I'm afraid, said Tobermory, whose tone and attitude did not suggest much embarrassment. Well, when your inclusion in this house party was suggested, Sir Wilfrid protested that you were the most brainless woman he'd ever met, and that there was a wide distinction between hospitality and care for the feeble-minded. To which Lady Blemley replied that your lack of brain power was the precise quality which had earned you your invitation, as you are the only person she could think of who might be stupid enough to buy their old car. You know, the one they call the envy of Sisyphus, because it goes quite nicely uphill if you push it. Now, Lady Blemley's protestations would have had greater effect if she had not that very morning casually suggested to Mavis that the car in question would be just the thing for her down at her Devonshire home. Major Barfield now plunged in to effect a diversion. <laughs> How about you carrying on with the, the tortoiseshell puss, eh? Up at the stables, Toby. The moment he said it, everyone realised the blunder. I'm sorry, said Tobermory. So, so does one usually discuss these matters in public? I mean, from the slightest observation of your way since you've been in the house, Major, I should imagine you find it very inconvenient if I have to shift the conversation to your own little affairs. The panic which ensued was not confined to the old soldier. A narrow ornamental balustrade, you see, ran in front of most of the bedroom windows at the towers, and it was recalled with dismay that this formed a favourite promenade for Tobermory, whence he could watch the pigeons and heaven knows what else besides. I mean, if he intended to become reminiscent in this present outspoken strain, the effect would be something more than disconcerting. Mrs. Cornet, who spent much time at a toilet table and whose complexion was reputed to be of a nomadic, although punctual, disposition, looked as ill at ease as the major. Miss Scrowan, who wrote fiercely sensuous poetry and led a blameless life, merely displayed irritation. I mean, if you're methodical and virtuous in private, you don't necessarily want everyone to know it. Bertie Van Tarn, who was so depraved at 17 that he'd long ago given up trying to be any worse, turned a dull shade of Jardinia white. But he did not commit the error of dashing out of the room like Odo Finsbury a young gentleman who was reading for the church and who was possibly disturbed at the thought of scandal as he might hear concerning other people. Clovis alone had the presence of mind to maintain a composed exterior, but privately even he was calculating how long it would take to procure a box of fancy mice through the agency of the exchange and mart as a species of hush money. Even in a delicate situation like the present, however, Agnes Resca could not bear to remain long in the background. Oh, why did I ever come down here? She asked dramatically. Tobermory immediately accepted the opening. Well, Agnes, judging by what you said to Mrs. Cornish on the croquet lawn yesterday, you're out of food. You, you described the Blemleys as the dullest host in England, but said they were clever enough to employ a first-rate cook. Otherwise, I'd find it difficult to get anyone to visit a second time. There is not a word of truth in it. I appeal to Mrs. Cornet. Yeah, Mrs. Cornet repeated your remark afterwards to Bertie Van Tarn, continued Tobermory. That woman's a regular hunger marcher, she said. And Bertie Van Tarn. Meow! At this point, the chronicle mercifully ceased. Tobermory had caught sight of the big yellow tomcat from the rectory, working his way through the shrubbery towards the stable wing, and in a flash he'd vanished hissing through the open French window. Well, with the disappearance of his brilliant pupil, Cornelius Appin found himself in a hurricane of bitter upbraiding, anxious inquiry and frightened entreaty. The responsibility for the situation lay with him. Everybody insisted and he must prevent matters from getting worse. And could Tobermory impart his dangerous gift to other cats? That was the first question he had to answer. Well, yeah. I mean, it was possible, he replied, yes. I mean, he, he might conceivably have initiated in, his intimate friend, the, the stable puss, into his new accomplishment, but it was unlikely that his teaching could have reached a wider range as yet. Then, said Mrs. Cornet, Tobermory may be a valuable cat and a much-loved pet, but I'm sure you'll agree, Adelaide, that both he and the stable cat must be executed without delay. Why, do you suppose I've enjoyed the last quarter of an hour? said Lady Blemley bitterly. My husband and I are very fond of Tobermory. At least we were before this 
horrid accomplishment was infused into him. But now, of course, yes, the, the only thing is to make him die as soon as possible. But we can put some strychnine in, in the, the scraps he gets for dinner, said Sir Wilfred, and, and I'll go and drown the stable puss myself. The, the coachman will be sore at losing his pet, but I'll, I'll say that a very catching form of mange has broken out in the animals, and we're afraid of spreading it to the kennels. But, but, but my discovery, cried Cornelius Appin, all my years of research. Yeah, well, you can go and experiment on the short horns at the farm said Mrs. Cornet. They're under proper control at least, and they have this recommendation that they don't spend their time creeping about bedrooms and lurking under armchairs. Well, an archangel proclaiming the millennium and finding that it clashed with the Henley Regatta could hardly have felt more crestfallen than Cornelius Appin. Public opinion was, however, quite against him. In fact, had the general voice been consulted on the subject, it's probable that a strong minority would have been in favour of including him in the strychnine diet. Well, defective train arrangements and a nervous desire to see matters brought to a finish prevented an immediate dispersal of the party. But dinner that evening was not a social success. Sir Wilfred had had a rather trying time with the, the stable cat and her owner. Agnes Resca ostentatiously limited herself to a morsel of dry toast, which she nibbled on as her personal enemy. Mavis Pellington maintained a vindictive silence throughout the meal, and although Lady Blemley herself kept up a flow of what she hoped was conversation, her attention was constantly fixed on the doorway. A plate of carefully dosed fish scraps was in readiness on the sideboard, but sweets and savoury and dessert went their way, and no Tobermory appeared in the dining room or the kitchen. The dinner was cheerful, however, compared with the vigil in the smoking room that followed it. Eating and drinking had at least supplied a cloak to the prevailing embarrassment. Bridge was out of the question, of course, in the, the general tension of nerves and tempers. And after Odo Finsbury had given a lugubrious rendering of Melisande in the wood to a frigid audience, music was tacitly avoided. At 11 o'clock, the, the servants went to bed, announcing that the small window in the pantry had been left open, as usual, for Tobermory's private use. And Lady Blemley made periodic visits there returning each time with an expression of listless depression which forestalled all questioning. At two o'clock in the morning, Clovis broke the dominating silence. Yeah, well, he won't turn up tonight. He's probably at the local newspaper office this moment, dictating the first instalment of his memoirs. And having made this contribution to the general cheerfulness, Clovis went to bed, and at intervals the various members of the house party followed his example. The servants, taking round the early tea next day, made a uniform announcement in reply to a uniform question. Tobermory had not returned. Breakfast was, if anything, a more unpleasant function than dinner had been. But just before its conclusion, the situation was relieved when Tobermory's corpse was brought in from the shrubbery where a gardener had just discovered it. Now, from the bites on his throat and the yellow fur which coated his claws, it was evident that he had fallen in unequal combat with the big Tom from the rectory. By midday, most of the guests had quitted the towers, and after lunch, Lady Blemley had sufficiently recovered her spirits to write an extremely nasty letter to the rector about the loss of a valuable pet. Tobermory had been Mr Appin's one successful pupil, and he was destined to have no successor. A few weeks later, an elephant in the Dresden Zoological Garden, who had previously shown no signs of irritability, broke loose and killed an Englishman who had apparently been teasing it. The victim's name was variously reported in the papers as Oppin and Epperlin, but his front name was faithfully rendered Cornelius. Sylvia Selton ate her breakfast in the morning room at Yesney with a pleasant sense of ultimate victory. She was scarcely 
pugnacious by temperament. No, she belonged rather to that more successful class of fighters who were pugnacious by circumstance. Fate had willed that her life should be occupied with a series of small struggles, usually with the odds slightly against her, and usually Sylvia had just managed to come through winning. And now, here, this morning, she felt that she'd finally brought her hardest and most important struggle to a successful issue. To have married Mortimer Selton, dead Mortimer, as his more intimate enemies called him, in the teeth of the cold hostility of his family, and in spite of his unaffected indifference to women, was indeed an achievement that had needed some determination and adroitness to carry through. Yesterday, however, she brought her victory to its concluding stage by wrenching her husband away from town and its group of satellite watering places and settling him down in the vocabulary of her kind in this remote woodgirt manor farm, the Selton country seat. You'll never get Mortimer to go, his mother had said carpingly, but if he does go, he'll stay for good. Yesney throws almost as much a spell over him as town does, and one can understand what holds him to town, but Yesney, hmm. and the dowager had trailed off with a shrug of her shoulders. I mean, that there was, it was true, a sombre, almost savage wildness about the estate that was certainly not likely to appeal to town-bred tastes. Sylvia herself, who, notwithstanding her name, was accustomed to nothing leafier than West Kensington, looked on the countryside as something excellent and wholesome in its way, but which was apt to become troublesome if you encourage it overmuch. Distrust of town life had been a new thing with her, born of her marriage to Mortimer, but she'd watched with satisfaction the gradual fading of what she called the German street look in his eyes as the woods and heather of Yesney had closed in on them yesternight. Her willpower and strategy had prevailed. Mortimer would stay. Outside the morning room, was a triangular slope of turf, which the indulgent might call a lawn, and beyond its low hedge of neglected fuchsia bushes, a steeper slope of heather and bracken dropped down into cavernous coombs overgrown with yew and oak. In Yesney's wild open savagery, there seemed a, a stealthy linking of the joy of life with the terror of unseen things. Sylvia smiled complacently as she gazed with a school of art appreciation at the landscape, and then of a sudden, she almost shuddered. Mortimer had just joined her. <laughs> it is very wild, she said. But one could almost think in such a place as this that worship of Pan had never quite died out. It never has, said Mortimer. No, other newer gods have drawn aside his votaries from time to time, of course, but, but Pan's the one that we all come back to in the end. He's been called the father of all the gods, although most of his children have been stillborn. Now, Sylvia was religious in an honest, vaguely devotional kind of way, and she didn't like to hear her beliefs spoken of as mere afterthoughts. But it was at least something new and hopeful to hear dead Mortimer speak with such conviction on the subject. <laughs> you don't really believe in Pan, do you, darling? She said, half laughing. Oh, I've been a fool in most things. Mortimer replied, but I'm not such a fool as not to believe in Pan when I'm at Yesney. And if you're wise, you won't disbelieve him in too boastfully either. Well, it was not a week later, when Sylvia had exhausted the woodland walks around the estate, that she ventured on a tour of inspection of the farm buildings. Now, the word farmyard had always suggested in her mind a scene of cheerful bustle with churns and flails and smiling dairymaids, teams of horses knee-deep in duck ponds. But as she wandered among the gaunt grey buildings of the manor farm that morning, the overwhelming impression was of crushing stillness and desolation, as though she'd happened on some deserted homestead long given over to owls and cobwebs. There was a sense, too, of furtive watchful hostility, the same shadow of unseen things that seemed to lurk in the, the coombs and heavy doors and shuttered windows came the restless stamp of hoof or rasp of chain halter, at times a muffled bellow from some stalled beast. From a distant corner a shaggy dog watched her with unfriendly eyes and as she drew near it slipped into its kennel, slipping out again when she passed by. <laughs> 
a few hens questing for food under a rick stole away under a gate at her approach. Sylvia felt that if she had come across any human beings in this wilderness of barn and byre, they too would have fled wraith-like from her gaze. At last, turning a corner, she came upon a living thing that did not fly from her. A stretch in a pool of mud was an enormous sow, gigantic beyond the town woman's wildest computation of swine flesh. It seemed alert to resent and, if necessary, repel any unwanted intrusion, and so Sylvia made an unobtrusive retreat. But as she threaded her way past rickyards and cowsheds and along blank walls, she started suddenly at a strange sound. The echo of a boy's laughter, golden and equivocal. Jan, the only boy employed on the farm, a tow-headed, wizen-faced local, was visibly at work on a potato clearing halfway up the nearest hillside, and Mortimer, when questioned, knew of no other probable or possible begetter of the hidden mockery that had ambushed his wife's retreat. The memory of that untraceable echo was added to her other impressions of a, a furtive sinister something that hung around Yesney. Of Mortimer himself, she saw very little. Farm and woods and trout streams seemed to swallow him up from dawn till dusk. Once, following the direction she'd seen him take in the morning, she came to an open space in a nut copse, further shut in by huge yew trees, in the centre of which stood a stone pedestal surmounted by a small bronze figure of a youthful pan. It was a beautiful piece of workmanship, but Sylvia's attention was chiefly held by the fact that a newly cut bunch of grapes had been placed as an offering at its feet. Now grapes were none too plentiful at the manor house, and Sylvia snatched the bunch angrily from the pedestal. Contemptuous annoyance dominated her thoughts as she strolled slowly homeward, but this suddenly gave way to a sharp feeling of something very close to fright. Across a tangle of undergrowth, a boy's face was scowling at her, brown, rather beautiful, but with unutterably evil eyes. Well, it was a lonely pathway, and Sylvia hurried on her way. I mean, it was not until she'd reached the house that she discovered that she'd dropped the bunch of grapes in her flight. I saw a youth today, she told Mortimer that evening, in the woods, brown-faced, rather handsome, but a, a scoundrel to look at, gypsy lad, I suppose. Well, a reasonable theory, said Mortimer. Only, only there aren't any gypsies in these parts at present. Well, then who was he? said Sylvia. And as Mortimer appeared to know, have no theory of his own, she passed on to recount a discovery of the votive offering. I suppose that was your doing, she asked. <laughs> well, it's a harmless piece of lunacy, I suppose, but people would think you dreadfully silly if they knew about it. Did you meddle with it in any way? asked Mortimer. The, the, the statue, I mean. Well, I threw the grapes away. Seems so silly. Hmm. I, I, I don't think you're wise to do that, my dear. Now, I, I've heard it said that the wood gods can be rather horrible to those who molest them. <laughs> horrible to those that believe in them, perhaps, retorted Sylvia. All the same, said Mortimer, I should avoid the woods and orchards if I were you. And, and give a wide berth to the horned beasts on the farm. For, for the time being, at any rate. Well, I mean, it was all nonsense, of course, but in that lonely, woodgirt spot, nonsense seemed able to rear a bastard brood of uneasiness. Mortimer, said Sylvia suddenly, I think that we'll go back to town soon. A victory had not been so complete as she'd supposed. But Mortimer just replied quietly, Oh, no, I, I don't think you'll ever go back to town, my dear. And he left the room. Well, Sylvia noted with dissatisfaction and some self-contempt that the course of her next afternoon's ramble took her instinctively clear of the network of woods. As to the horned cattle, Mortimer's warning was scarcely needed. She'd always regarded them as of doubtful neutrality at the best, and her imagination turned even the most matronly dairy cows into rampant bulls. 
The ram who fed in the narrow paddock below the orchards, she had adjudged after ample and cautious probation to be of docile temper, but today she decided to leave his docility untested. This usually tranquil beast was roaming with every sign of restlessness from corner to corner of his meadow. And a low fitful piping as of some reedy flute was coming from the depth of a neighbouring copse, and that there seemed to be some subtle connection between this animal's restless pacing and the wild music from the wood. Sylvia therefore turned her steps in an upward direction and climbed the heather-clad slopes that stretched in rolling hills high above Yesney. She left the, the piping notes behind her, but across the wooded copses now, the wind brought another kind of music, the straining bay of hounds in full chase. Yesney was just on the outskirts of the Devon and Somerset country, and the hunted deer did sometimes come that way. And Sylvia could presently see a dark body breasting hill after hill and sinking again and again out of sight as he, he crossed the coombs. Behind him swelled that relentless chorus, and she grew tense with the excited sympathy that one feels for any hunted thing in whose capture one is not directly interested. At last, the beast broke through the outermost line of oak scrub and fern and stood panting in the open. It was a fat September stag carrying a, a well-furnished head. I mean, his obvious course was to drop down to the brown pools of undercombe and to make his way towards the sea. But to Sylvia's surprise, he turned his head to the upland slope and came lumbering resolutely on over the heather. Oh, how dreadful, she thought. The hounds will pull him down under my very eyes. But the music of the pack seemed to have died away for a moment. And in its place, she heard again that wild piping, rising now on this side, now on that, as though urging the failing stag to a final effort. Sylvia stood well aside from his path, half hidden in a thick growth of hortle bushes, and she watched him swing stiffly upwards, his dark flanks with sweat, the coarse hair on his neck showing light by contrast. The pipe music suddenly thrilled around her. It seemed to come from the bushes at her very feet, and at the same moment the great beast slewed round and bore directly down upon her. In an instant, pity for the hunted animal was changed to a wild terror at her own danger. The thick heather roots mocked her scrambling efforts at flight, and she looked frantically downward for a glimpse of the oncoming hounds. The huge antler spikes were within a few yards of her now, and in a flash of numbing fear, she remembered Mortimer's warning to beware of horned beasts on the farm. Then, with a quick throb of joy, she saw that she was not alone. A human figure stood a few paces aside, knee-deep in the hortle bushes. Drive it off! she shrieked. And then, please help me! But the figure made no answering movement. The antlers drave stroked at her breast. The acrid smell of the hunted animal was in her nostrils. But Sylvia Selton's eyes were filled with the horror of something she saw other than her coming death. And in her ears rang the echo of a boy's laughter, golden and equivocal.